One of the seven properties of life is reproduction. All living things need to have the ability to reproduce to make more of themselves. And regardless of what type of organism this is, that particular organism is going to have to make more cells. The first step in this process is for the dividing cells to make more of their own DNA. This is a process called DNA replication. DNA replication occurs through a highly conserved mechanism, but is also a highly complex mechanism. That's what we're going to talk about today. Today we are going to talk about the steps of DNA replication, how this process occurs, and the proteins that are involved. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about DNA replication. DNA replication is a process that can occur in all living cells. DNA replication is the first step in the process of cell division. Now, in multicellular organisms, cells can divide for a lot of different reasons. They can divide uh, during growth and development, they can divide to replace damaged cells or damaged tissue, or it could be division to begin replicating the entire organism, a process known as reproduction. In bacterial cells, cell division is reproduction. It is the reproduction of the next generation of that particular organism. But regardless of whether we're talking about a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell, the process of DNA replication is actually remarkably conserved, as you'll see in a few minutes. Now, DNA replication occurs when a cell is going to divide. And when a cell divides, it needs to replicate its genome. When we use the term genome, what we're talking about is the sum total of all genetic information found within a cell. Prokaryotic genomes are slightly different than eukaryotic ones. For example, in a bacterial cell, what you will find in terms of its genome is typically a single circular double-stranded DNA chromosome. It's not going to be located within a nucleus because those cells don't have it, and it's typically not wrapped around proteins, which we find in eukaryotes. Bacterial genomes are also typically smaller, usually measured in millions of base pairs of DNA, as opposed to billions of base pairs of DNA. They also may contain these small extra chromosomal pla things called plasmids, these small circular strands of uh, double-stranded DNA that can also be part of that particular organism's genome. When we look at eukaryotic genomes, we are going to typically find multiple linear chromosomes. So your genome, for example, consists of 46 linear chromosomes, and those chromosomes consist of DNA wrapped around proteins called histones. So all organisms have a genome, but what it looks like depends on whether you're a prokaryote, which means you're typically small and circular double-stranded DNA, or a eukaryote, which is typically more complex DNA found in linear chromosomes. But as I said before, whether you're a prokaryote or a eukaryote, the process of replicating that DNA is actually remarkably conserved. But it's going to involve lots of different proteins, and that's what we'll talk about in this video. Now, the first thing we need to know about DNA replication is that it occurs through something called the semi-conservative mechanism. This was originally discovered back in 1958 by Meselson and Stahl, who performed an experiment using what was referred to as heavy DNA. They used radioactive isotopes of certain atoms to determine how the DNA separated. What I mean by the semi-conservative mechanism is that each strand of that double-stranded DNA found in the chromosomes is going to serve as a template for a new complementary strand. The end result then is when that particular cell divides, each daughter cell will have half of its genome consisting of the original DNA that was found in the parent cell and half newly synthesized DNA that was synthesized using that original parent strand as a template to synthesize a new complementary strand. So this process is known as the semi-conservative mechanism, which is contrasted with the other potential mechanisms known as the conservative mechanism and the dispersive mechanism, which have now been ruled out. Those do not occur in living things. It's the semi-conservative mechanism that we find in all living cells. Now, this process, which seems relatively simple from this perspective, is actually quite complex. There's going to be lots of different proteins involved, but the main one we need to focus on, the one that's going to do the heavy lifting, the one that actually is going to synthesize new DNA, is called DNA polymerase. Now, if we're talking about DNA polymerase, we're not actually talking about a single protein. For example, bacteria have three different DNA polymerases, named DNA pole one, 
DNA pole 2 and DNA pole 3. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have up to 14 different polymerases, uh, DNA polymerases, and they are labeled with Greek letters like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. And we'll talk about the differences between those uh, later on in this video. But DNA polymerase can't do its job alone because it needs lots of other proteins to put the particular DNA in the right conformation in order to be replicated. And to do this, there's going to need to be several other proteins involved. So let's talk about what those are. The first protein that's going to be needed in order to replicate DNA is a protein called helicase. So helicase, which is typically depicted as a wedge or a triangle, the job of helicase is actually to unwind and separate the two strands of DNA. See, DNA polymerase can't actually replicate DNA from a double-stranded molecule. It needs to be single-stranded so that each strand can serve as a template for the replication of a, or for the synthesis of a new complementary DNA strand. So helicase's job is to go in and separate the two strands of DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the bases together. But those two strands are not going to stay apart for long if just left alone. Because remember, the hydrogen bonds that form, form between the bases because they are attracted to each other. They are polar covalent molecules that are going to be attracted to each other to form those hydrogen bonds. So how then does the cell keep those two strands of DNA apart long enough for DNA polymerase to come in and do its job? Well, that's the job of single-stranded binding proteins. These are typically abbreviated as SSBs or SSBPs. Single-stranded binding proteins come in and they hold the two strands apart and prevent the hydrogen bonds from reforming between the two template strands. So once single-stranded binding proteins come in, uh, now it's going to be those two strands are going to stay separate uh, for uh, as long as needed during the DNA replication process. But there's also some other issues with DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is actually kind of persnickety. DNA polymerase can't just start synthesizing new DNA on a single stranded template. It needs what's called a three prime hydroxy. It needs a free three prime hydroxyl molecule, uh, uh, functional group in order to start the process. Because the two strands have been completely separated, there is no three, free three prime hydroxy or hydroxyl uh, functional group for it to begin synthesis on. So essentially what it needs is a, a small double-stranded template to at least kickstart the process of DNA replication. That's where another enzyme called primase comes into play. So primase comes in, it works on the single-stranded template, and it lays down a small 5 to 10 nucleotide primer. This primer is going to serve as a landing spot for DNA polymerase. It's sort of a starting point where DNA polymerase can begin making new DNA. But there's a weird evolutionary quirk about primase. Even though we're replicating DNA, primase can only put down RNA primers. So in other words, once helicases come along and separated the two strands of DNA, and you have the single-stranded binding proteins holding those strands apart, primase is going to come in and basically make a landing site called a primer for DNA polymerase. Unfortunately, that particular primer is going to be made out of RNA, which it's going to cause a problem later on in the process, and it's going to have to be cleaned up. So once we get done replicating our DNA, we'll come back and we'll talk about how we have to go about um, removing these primers and cleaning up our mess that we're about to make. A couple other proteins that are going to need to be involved. One of them is called topoisomerase. So as you're separating the two strands of DNA, one of the things that's going to happen is the, the wound, and remember the, the DNA is an alpha helix, right? So it's kind of wound around itself. Well, as you're pulling those two strands apart, what can happen downstream of this, so in front of the helicase enzyme, is the, the DNA downstream can actually get tied into some pretty tight knots. This is what's known as supercoiling. So the term for this is supercoiling of DNA. The enzyme topoisomerase actually comes in, and its job is to prevent this supercoiling coiling from happening. So it works ahead of the replication fork. So that opening, that wedge that helicase is driving in to separate the two strands is what's called a replication fork. In front of that replication fork, topoisomerase is going along and unwinding the DNA and preventing it from forming this supercoiled knot, which would inhibit the entire process from occurring. So topoisomerase is yet another essential enzyme needed to make this process happen. So now we have helicase that's created the replication fork. It's now opened up the double-stranded DNA, making a single-stranded template. We have single-stranded binding proteins holding these things apart. We have 
we have primates coming along and laying down a short RNA primer so that there's a landing spot for DNA polymerase. And we have topo isomerase working ahead of the replication fork, making sure our DNA doesn't get super coiled. That's all going on all at once. We're now ready for DNA polymerase to come in and begin the process of replication. But before we talk about how that happens, we have to remind ourselves of what DNA actually looks like. So remember that DNA is a nucleic acid that's formed out of nucleotide monomers, the A's, C's, G's, and T's. Well, these A's, C's, G's, and T's, uh, these nucleotides uh, look like this. You have your, uh, you have your uh, nucleotide base, the, the adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine, that is attached to a ribose sugar, actually a deoxyribose sugar, and then that deoxyribose sugar is covalently bound to a phosphate group. And when we synthesize nucleic acids, what's going to happen is each sequential nucleotide is going to be covalently bound to the nucleotide after it through a phosphodiester bond. This happens when the five prime carbon attaches to the three prime carbon of the next uh, nucleotide in order via that phosphate group that it has. The thing to remember about DNA then is it has directionality. It runs in five prime to three prime orientation, but that single strand of DNA is going to be hydrogen bonded to another strand. And that, that hydrogen bond that attaches it to the hydrogen bonds, I should say, that attach it to that complementary strand of DNA occurs in the middle between the two bases. And that occurs through that base pairing laws, whereas adenine, adenine always hydrogen bonds with thymine and cytosine always bonds with guanine via hydrogen bonding via base pairing rules. Okay. Well, in order for that hydrogen bonding to happen, one of the strands of DNA needs to be upside down relative to the other. That's where the term anti-parallel comes from. So essentially, when you look at the double-stranded DNA molecule, one strand is running 5 prime to 3 prime in this direction, and the other strand is running 5 prime to 3 prime in the opposite direction. The bases have to be upside down relative to each other in order for the hydrogen bonding to actually occur. Why am I telling you all this and why am I focusing so much on the directionality of the DNA strands? Because now it's going to matter. And the reason it's going to matter has to do with how DNA polymerase operates. It turns out that DNA polymerase in all living things can only synthesize DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. In order for that to happen, it needs to be reading a template that is running three prime to five prime. Well, if we look at what's happening with the replication fork, you may have already figured out that we have a small problem. So if we have the replication fork running in one direction, DNA polymerase on one strand, synthesizing DNA on one strand of the single-stranded DNA template can follow right behind, the right behind the helicase enzyme. Essentially, synthesis of DNA is occurring in the direction in which the replication fork is opening. Now, this particular strand or the replication of this particular strand is actually quite easy. You need a single RNA primer provided by primase, a single DNA polymerase enzyme will land on that primer and then begin synthesizing DNA by following behind that helicase enzyme as the replication fork opens up in front of it. Essentially, everywhere it goes, new template is being created for it. This is what's known as the leading strand. And leading strand synthesis is quite quick. It involves typically a single primer and a single DNA polymerase enzyme, at least in bacteria. But what about the other strand? You can see that this strand is oriented in the opposite direction. In other words, it's five prime to three prime leading towards the way the replication fork is opening. Well, if that's going to serve as a template for the synthesis of new DNA, the synthesis of that new DNA has to be going in the direction opposite to which the replication fork is opening. Do you see where the problem is with this? The problem is you need to have primase come in and lay a primer down, but primase can only lay a primer down on a single strand of DNA template, and the synthesis is going to have to happen opposite the direction the replication fork is moving. What's the solution to this? Well, the solution to this is actually kind of simple. What's going to happen is every 150 to 200 nucleotides or so that open up via the activity of helicase at the replication fork a new primer is going to be laid down. So essentially primase goes down following helicase, dropping primers onto that single strand template every 150 to 200 nucleotides. Then a different DNA polymerase enzyme will have to land on each of these primers and then synthesize that new DNA going in the direction opposite to which the replication fork is opening. 
in short little 150 to 200 nucleotide chunks. These little chunks of DNA that get synthesized on what is called the lagging strand are known as Okazaki fragments, and they're named after the researchers who discovered it. Well, one of the things that happens with lagging strand synthesis then is, first, it's slower. Why? We need lots of different primers and we need lots of different uh, polymerases to make this happen, and you can only synthesize as new template opens up. The other issue with the lagging strand, as we'll see when we start talking about cleanup, is we have lots and lots of primers. So if you look at a genome of E. coli, for example, that has 4.6 million base pairs, well, if you're synthesizing that lagging strand in 200 base pair chunks, that's lots and lots of primers that are going to need to be removed and replaced with DNA when we get to the cleanup stage. So this is what's happening at one replication fork. And when I say one replication fork, the other thing we have to realize is anywhere where replication is occurring, what's called the origin of replication, for example, the origin of replication, also known as the origin, is where replication actually begins. So when you look at an origin, and bacteria typically have one on each chromosome, whereas eukaryotes often have multiple origins on each chromosome, you will see that each origin is going to have two replication forks. DNA replication is not going to occur in one direction around the chromosome. It's going to happen in both directions. So while we've been focusing on a single replication fork caused by a single helicase enzyme and a single topoisomerase, there's another replication fork on the other side of the origin working in the opposite direction. These replication forks and, as, and the machinery that operates essentially function as a mirror image of the one we were just talking about. What does that mean? Well, what that means is when you look at the other replication fork with the helicase working in the opposite direction and the replication fork then opening in the opposite direction, well, guess what? The leading strand and the lagging strand switch. The, or, the, the orientation of the DNA molecules didn't change at all, but because the replication fork is opening in the opposite direction, what is the lagging strand on one side of the origin is actually the leading strand on the other. And what is the leading strand on one side of uh, the, the origin is actually the lagging strand on the other. And this is simply due to the fact that the replication forks are opening in opposite directions. So if we're looking at the process of DNA replication, Around a prokaryotic circular chromosome, what will happen is both replication forks will continue to extend with leading strand and lagging strand synthesis happening all the way around the bacterial chromosome until the two replication forks essentially collide. And at that point, the bacterial chromosome will be completely replicated and you will now have two circular double-stranded DNA molecules that have been replicated through the semi-conservative mechanism. In other words, if you take each of those two bacterial chromosomes and look at them, one of the strands will be the original parental DNA, and one of them will be the newly synthesized complementary strand. Each of those circular double-stranded DNA molecules can then be uh, divided into the two daughter cells following one bacteria. It's called binary fission. So once the replication process is complete, we're not quite done. We have to go through a cleanup process. One of the biggest issues we're going to have after replication is complete is what do we do with all of those RNA primers that are laying around? We can't have RNA be a part of our DNA and neither can bacteria. So what's gonna happen is the in bacterial cells, there's going to be a version of DNA polymerase. So the type of DNA polymerase that does most of the DNA replication in bacterial cells is DNA pol 3. So DNA polymerase 3 is what's been doing most of the DNA replication throughout the process. A different type of DNA polymerase, DNA pol 1, is gonna come in and it's going to use its exonuclease activity. So exonuclease activity is the ability to sort of cut and remove nucleotides. It's going to remove all of those RNA primers and then replace it with complementary DNA molecules. So essentially, it comes in, removes the RNA primers, then lays down DNA to replace those RNA primers and fill in those gaps. The small problem that we have with DNA pole 1 is that it can't replace the phosphodiester bonds that occur between the backbone. That will be accomplished by a different enzyme called lagase. So DNA polymerase removes the RNA, DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA, replaces it with DNA, and then ligase comes in and sort of stitches the backbone together to make sure that we have a single contiguous molecule. Another thing we have to, to worry about after replication is were there mistakes made? So DNA polymerase 3 and all DNA polymerases have proofreading capabilities. In other words, as DNA polymerase 3 is going about its business and 
in synthesizing new complementary DNA, if it makes a mistake, for example, it pairs a G up with an A, that's not the correct base pair, it will actually pause, go back, use its exonuclease activity to remove the wrong, the wrong DNA nucleotide and replace it with the correct nucleotide and then go about its business. However, DNA polymerase 3 is not perfect and it occasionally makes mistakes. So what will actually happen after DNA replication is complete is a bunch of enzymes that are proofreading enzymes are going to come in and they're going to look for mistakes. They're going to come in and they're going to do, uh, they're going to see if there are any mismatched bases. So any G's paired with T's or A's paired with uh, A's paired with C's, for example, and it will remove them through a process called mismatch repair. This process, again, isn't completely foolproof. Uh, in E. coli cells, for example, the error rate of replication is somewhere around uh, 1 in 100 million uh, bases. So in, out of 100 million bases, about one typically gets placed in mistakenly. That's called a mutation, um, which means that in about every 25 cell divisions, a, an E. coli cell uh, gets a new mutation despite all of these proofreading efforts. What's crazy about that is that still is that still leads to a lot of mutation within the species. What I want you to think about is this, an E. coli cell can replicate every 20 minutes or so under good conditions. Now think about the trillions of different E. coli cells that exist on the planet Earth, and the law of large numbers starts to take over. If we look at the mutation rate of DNA replication in E. coli cells, as well as the rate of replication of E. coli cells, and include the number of E. coli cells on the planet Earth, what that actually means is a new mutation appears within each gene inside of the E. coli genome every 24 hours. And that seems crazy, but it's actually true. And what I want you to think about is if this is happening under normal conditions, under sort of resting conditions in an E. coli cell, how fast can mutations that lead to antibiotic resistance actually occur in pathogenic bacteria that are under uh, intense selection pressure through antibiotics? And the answer is really fast. And that's kind of the reason why antibiotic resistance has become quite the problem that it has. What does that mean in your context? Well, you have a roughly the same mutation rate in your DNA replication in humans. Well, you have three billion base pairs. And what's really interesting about this, and based on the number of cells that you have and so on and so forth, that means each individual that's born has somewhere between 10 and 100 different mutations uh, that neither of their parents actually have. We call those novel mutations, which is also kind of interesting. And that's one of the reasons why your DNA is unique and different from that of your parents. So, now that we've gone through all the process of replication, now that we've uh, done, we've removed our primers and we've cleaned up the mess and we've checked for as many errors as we're going to detect, let's talk about the differences between eukaryotic replication and bacterial replication. So, uh, one of the things that, so what I should mention first off, the overall mechanism is not that different. It's still a semi-conservative mechanism. You're still going to have DNA polymerase and basically the replication fork is going to look the same and behave the same. You're going to have leading strand and you're going to have lagging strand. But what's going to be different is the numbers of different options that particular cell has for the proteins. So, for example, uh, let's talk about one of the key differences. If we look at a bacterial circular chromosome, there will be a single origin. If we look at a eukaryotic linear chromosome, there are, are going to be multiple origins of replication occurring simultaneously on each chromosome. The reason for this is simple. If our genomes are measured in billions of base pairs, as opposed to the millions of base pairs of, of bacteria, if we were to replicate each chromosome with a single origin of replication, it would take forever. It would be completely impossible for, uh, for cells to divide in a timely manner. So we need to have multiple origins of replication. And essentially, these replication bubbles, as they form, will begin to replicate until they bump into another uh, replication or, or origin of replication, and then they'll stop and they'll realize that they've now synthesized the entire chromosome. They'll go through the whole process of proofreading and cleaning up their mess by the removal of primers and so on and so forth. There's another difference. How are primers removed? So we talked about in bacteria that they are removed through the activity of DNA polymerase. Not so in eukaryotes. They're removed by an enzyme called RNase H. And then a different DNA polymerase comes in and replaces those RNA primers. And then ligase comes in and stitches the backbone together. Other thing to note, eukaryotes have up to 14 different polymerases in their cells. Uh, alpha through epsilon are known to have activities involved in DNA replication. So once, so one particular DNA polymerase is tasked with the job of replacing 
uh, the RNA primers once they've been removed by RNA-SH. You actually have one polymerase whose job it is to synthesize the leading strand at the origin of replication, and you have another who's tasked specifically with doing the lagging strand. So there's actually a different polymerase that synthesizes the leading strand and the, than the lagging strand, which is also kind of interesting. Uh, in order to load DNA polymerase onto the actual DNA, uh, there's something called the sliding clamp in prokaryotes. It's needed for sort of loading DNA polymerase onto the DNA and holding it on there during the process of replication. In eukaryotes, the name for that particular protein, which functions basically the same, is called pro proliferating cell nuclear antigen. And for obvious reasons, we just call it PCNA, which is detected as something that's always present in cells that are replicating or proliferating. So there's another difference there. The other thing that we should uh, think about is the problem with linear chromosomes. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you're dealing with a circular chromosome, essentially you just work your way around the circle until the two replication forks collide with each other and now you've replicated the entire DNA molecule. But the problem with linear chromosomes is they aren't circular, they have an end. Now for leading strand synthesis, this is not a problem. It basically continues to synthesize right behind the right behind the replication fork until essentially they run to the end of the road and all the DNA is, is, has been replicated. But what about the lagging strand? Remember, lagging strands need to have an RNA primer in order for synthesis of DNA to occur. When they get to the end of the chromosome, there is no place to put the final lagging strand primer. Therefore, the final few nucleotides of every single chromosome cannot be replicated on the lagging strand. And since you can't have single strand of DNA just kind of flopping out there at the end of the chromosome, essentially each chromosome, every time it gets replicated, gets slightly shorter than the last. So what happens if you start losing too much useful information? Well, the answer to that is it's bad. So how have eukaryotic chromosomes compensated for the fact that lagging strand synthesis can't happen on the chromosomes during replication, at least at the very end of the chromosomes, and they gradually shorten. Well, the answer to this is called, are called telomeres. So at the end of each eukaryotic chromosome, you have these repeating sequences, six nucleotide sequences, that essentially just repeat themselves somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times. Telomeres are protective because when the cell replicates and that little piece at the end of the chromosome can't be replicated and it gets cut off and shortened, well, that's okay because it doesn't contain useful information. This is not information that's going to encode uh, genes, which will eventually lead to proteins. So the telomeres gradually shorten with each replication of a cell each time the DNA is replicated. These are put there by an enzyme called telomerase. Now, here's a little bit, little funny thing about telomerase. Telomerase is not active in normal somatic cells. What that means is, even in your somatic cells, they are gradually losing their telomeres with each cell replication. Telomerase, as far as we know, is only active in two types of cells. First, they're active in normal functioning stem cells. Stem cells are these cool cells that can replicate over and over and over again. They're what we, the, the, the term we refer to describe them is immortal. Essentially, they can't die. And one of the reasons why they can't die is they have telomerase running around to make sure their telomeres always stay at a nice healthy length. The other type of cell that we know in some cases has telomerase active are cancer cells. And the fact that telomerase is active in cancer cells means that they too are immortal. In other words, they can divide as many times as they want to. They don't have a shelf life. And that may be one reason why cancer cells are so hard to get rid of. So there you have it, the process of DNA replication, a highly conserved and intricate mechanism by which DNA is replicated in all living things. You can see that while the mechanism is conserved, there are some differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Some of it has to do with the fact that the eukaryotic genome is typically bigger than prokaryotes, but also consists of linear chromosomes. I hope I was informative for you guys today. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thanks for tuning in.